My name is Luca Rossettini. I'm the CEO and founder of The Orbit. The Orbit is a space company that is creating uh, the first space logistics infrastructure to enable the $1 trillion space economy and human expansion in sustainable space. The first time I decided that I wanted to become an astronaut was when I was five years old. I was in the mountain with my uncle. My uncle was explaining uh, what the stars are uh, in a very technical way. And I do remember that I didn't understand anything, but I, I told to myself, like five years old kid, I want to go and check out what the stars are. And that's where I start my, let's say, my space career at that time. So I plan all my life to get there. So uh, the schools, the type of work, everything, every experience uh, was supposed to be aligned with this uh, final goal. I always worked uh, since I was a kid. Uh, I, I started selling toys outside of the kindergarten uh, when I was five. And just to get some money, you know, like to buy candies, whatever, when you are five years old. I worked during school, uh, every summer I was working. That actually was extremely important because you understand uh, the value of money, right? And that's, uh, for an entrepreneur, I think it's very important. He had a big fight with my parents and I have to decide to go to the high school because they wanted me to go to a, a technical high school that provide you with a degree that you can use to find a job immediately after. While I want to go to the high school that allow you to go to the university later on because to become an astronaut, you need to have certain degrees and so on. But my father said, okay, you go to this high school, but do remember that when you reach 18 years old, you are on your own and you have to pay for your university. When I reached 18 years old, my father came to me and said, okay, now you are 18. Do you have a job? Find a job if you wanna to go to the university. And that's what happened. So I started the university in one place. Then I joined the army uh, for a couple of years as a paratrooper officer. And then I continued the university in Milan. I finished all the money that I accumulated during my like, service in the army. Uh, they were supposed to last for the entire university. So I have to find a way to survive in Milan during the university. So I start selling cosmetics and I was lucky enough to find eight shops that were making orders every month. And that's how I survive at the, at the university. And then I start working for consultancies companies. And then at the end, I started my own business. So two companies before the orbit. The reality is that since I was a kid, I was selling stuff for survival, right? So uh, I became an entrepreneur for survivability. Even at the university, I didn't have money to eat. So like literally, I was not eating. So my fridge was empty for days. Selling stuff was, was the only thing that I, that, that, that I could uh, find without compromising the, like the school. And, and then you learn to deal with, um, with, with customers. I was working as a fishmonger. And so it's a very weird job because you have to wake up very early in the morning, but you start negotiating with the fishermen. At 5 a.m. in the morning, you are like fighting with the fishermen for, for, the, for the fish. Then you have to prepare the table where all the fish is, is put. So that's marketing, right? So the, the better it is, the, 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 the more you have the chance to sell. And then you have to deal with customers. And customers that buy fresh food are the worst customer in a, in, in a grocery store because they are always complaining about the freshness or about the, you know, the quality and so on. My colleagues were teaching me how to deal with them. And then uh, you realize that actually you're doing a good job when you see like a long line of people waiting to be served by you, then you realize, oh wow, that's, you know, I'm, I'm doing something good. Uh, so yes, it was a great experience for me. I learned to sell selling fish. That's, that's the reality, not satellites. When I decided to become an astronaut, I plan all my path to, to become an astronaut, even the two companies that I created. I did create a company because I need the flexibility in order to keep my training uh, running for becoming an astronaut. In Europe, you have one chance in a life. It's not like in US, you have a dozen astronauts every year. So it's all in, right? So either you become an astronaut or you will never fly into space. So 2008, I went through the astronaut contest, 2008 and 2009. Uh, and then at the end, when I was at the, one of the last phases of the contest, I received a letter saying, basically, try again later, you may be more lucky next time. So I was out and I have to decide what to do with my life because it was really all in, all my entire life, since I was five years old kid to when I, wore, I was like 28, something like that. I took this, uh, 
poster and, and I read Fulbright scholarship, we pay you the tuition, the, the, the trips and the, like the house and the, the food and, and we give you $1,000 per month just for your expenses. So I said, oh, that's weird. It's really too much. And then there was a sentence uh, saying uh, that that day, I, exactly when I was like reading that, there was a conference upstairs. They were explaining like this program. They were looking for potential entrepreneurs to send to Silicon Valley, study business there and create a company. I said, wow, that's exactly what I want to do. So I applied, I won the Fulbright Scholarship, I went to Silicon Valley, I studied there, and then uh, I joined NASA. I was working on a, in, in a very small team, in a small program that everybody else at NASA was against. They were thinking that we were wasting public money into a program that was useless. And that program was meant to build a small satellite and to study the economic feasibility of small satellite versus the huge and high-performing satellites that uh, typically at that time we were used to send in space. Something happened, right? So that, that, that was actually the, the, the incept of a new market. As Italian, we typically have lunch not earlier than like 1 p.m., right? So it's very unusual to eat before. But at NASA, they were all eating at like uh, 11 a.m. or like noon. The first two days, I was basically alone in the canteen. I was uh, there eating my food. And then there was a guy that actually came and since I was the only one, and he was like the second only person in that room, he, he sat in front of me and we start talking. And then my colleague came to, to call me and he was like, like you know, shaking the hand, oh, what? So basically the other person was Pete Warden, the head of NASA, the, the entire NASA Ames at that time. And he was the main sponsor of this program of Small Satellite. And he explained me that, uh, you know, the market is going to change soon. Uh, these huge dinosaur satellites will be no more in the future. So that's why I want you and your, like, uh, your colleagues to work on a new concept. So that's, that's how I started working on that project. You know, if you have plenty of money, you don't care, you design immediately, what you, you, you wait, you have years of runaway and so on. But that was not my case. No one was giving me a penny. So you really have to, to say, okay, I'm designing this piece of hardware, this product. I'm sure that I can sell it today. The market is small, it's a niche market, so I cannot generate a lot of money. So it means that to move to the next step, I cannot start again developing from zero another product. So I need to make sure that what I develop today, it's also uh, designed for tomorrow. Whatever we do, it's already designed thinking about the, the next steps. So for example, our cargo satellites today, when we design it, we use design to maintenance. We copy from the training industry. As a matter of fact, you don't need to have like maintenance on satellites. No one is doing that, right? But since it's designed to maintenance, the day after tomorrow, when there will be recycling stations in orbit, you can very easily disassemble my satellite and recycle entirely. So that's a competitive advantage that I'm injecting in my products today for the market of tomorrow. In an existing market, you can improve what is available with some innovation, or you can create a market that is not existing. Typically, it's way, way better and easier. It's still difficult, but it's easier to improve something that is existing because you, you know what is missing. When you are creating a new market, you speak with the customers that are telling you, oh, we don't need, you know, we, we are already doing in, in, in a standard way what, what we do. What they think at the beginning is not what they really need later on. So they tell you, oh, yes, blue, it's perfect. So if you go for the blue without keeping in contact with them and working with them, then you ended up, oh, you know what? I think green is best and you have to start again, right? So, uh, so that's why working on something that you can sell immediately, uh, even if it's not exactly the final arrival point and put inside this, the design for, for tomorrow, uh, give enough space for the customization according to where the market is going. In this way, you are more resilient. And again, it's always a matter of money, right? So if you have plenty of money, you don't care because resilience is embedded in the money you have in the bank account. But if you have zero money and every month you have to pay salaries, then you need to make sure that 
you reach that point with enough money in the bank to pay the salaries. So that's why we decide to go in this direction rather on the other one. That's a different way of, of doing business. I mean, I have to say that if we exist today, it's really thanks to this methodology. So it means that actually was a, was a good idea, at least for us. It doesn't mean that for others it's, uh, it's working in the same way. So I like to say that science fiction is the science of tomorrow. And as a matter of fact, if we think about uh, who are the readers of science fiction, uh, typically engineers and nerds, and then we think who's going to build the technology, engineers and nerds. So if you connect the dots, you end up that we are building the science fiction. When we start our business, uh, so it was uh, 2010, um, I didn't have the orbit yet, so it was not yet founded, and we were participating in this pitch competition in, in Houston, it was the RISE business plan competition. And NASA was there, not for us, we were the only space company pitching, and we were in the other, like segment, right? So, but they heard we were there, so, so they were curious to see, oh, there's a space company? So they came and, uh, and listened to my pitch, and at the end, in front of like 500 people listening to me, they said, Luca, you should go back to school and study, but not at the university, start again the high school. Okay, so that was 2010. 10 years later, the former administrator of the entire NASA recorded a video about the orbit stating, oh wow, NASA tried for 10 years to do what the orbit was able to do. It's amazing, we thought it was impossible. It's just a matter of having a very strong vision that is actually built with natural steps that are based on markets. So if I think back when I was five years old and look at me today, I would probably kick my ass, say, oh, you are not yet in space? Come on, hurry up, right? But, you know, we are getting closer. We are getting closer. We are transporting satellites. We are now building a spacecraft that is capable of transporting tons of satellites. So when you start transporting goods, then you step into the people, you create also the infrastructure for the information. It's just a matter of uh, doing in the right way, right? So make sure that you create a sustainable company. I will be in space. 100% uh, sure. As soon as we have the capability of traveling, like transporting people, I'll be there.